morning, everybody. I'd like to welcome you to church, and I hope we can all worship together and be thankful for the Lord has done for us.
you that you are the God of every moment. Lord, I thank you that you've been with us every moment of every day. Lord, we, we exalt you, we bless you today, and we thank you for what you have done in our lives. And Father, I pray that you would speak to us today, and I pray that we would hear your voice. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Welcome to church. We're so happy to have you here with us today. If you're a first time guest, we'd love to meet you and send you a gift. There's a link in the description below to our online connection card. You can fill that out and let us know who you are and let us get in touch with you. If you're a regular, we're so happy to have you here too. You can use that same link to tell us about a prayer needs you have or anything we can do for you. We love helping out our Kingsway family. Thank you so much for all you do for giving to your communities through us. We have lots of giving opportunities here at Kingsway. You can text any amount to 84321, go to our website and click give, or you can drop off or mail your amount to 7 Kingsway Drive. Thank you so much for all you do. And now it's time to bring the message. Ha <laughs> ha 
Thanks, Sophie. She has a great voice and mannerism for, for the, that sort of thing. I sort of picture her like giving instructions at a theme park. Please step into the, and don't touch the, and don't hold on to your, and uh, just, just very, very polished, very nice. Um, okay, is it possible to remember your code? Um, I was doing this one time in a service, may have told you before, I, I, when I first decided I was going to preach from my iPad, got into it, and uh, went blank on my code, and so I was talking and just, you know, uh, visiting with people and secretly typing in my code. This is when the iPads really first came out. And I began to type in the code, and I, what I didn't know at the time was after four or five attempts, it locks you out and says, you've been locked out and you'll be permitted back in in 10 minutes or 15 minutes or something. So I had to preach the whole message just kind of from memory. It was a very short, awkward service as the iPad locked up. And then since then, I've now smartened up. I have my phone as a backup um, just in case this fails, and I was telling Lisa on the way in that my phone is now at like 2% battery. So it could be a very short service if this goes, uh, goes sideways. Is it possible, though, to have a little bit of lights so I can look in your eyes? I don't want to mess up the, I know this has to go online and video, and Sophie, if it's not possible, fine. It's possible to him who believes. Okay, so let's get at it. This is our third of three, of course. Uh, and then this is my last Sunday with you. Pastor Tim, if you recall, uh, said, Jim, there's, uh, there's three really, really difficult commandments. I'd like you to come and preach on those. And then I'll come back and do the easy one. So next week, he's back, and he'll be telling you not to steal people's stuff. So that's kind of where he goes next week uh, when he gets back from Life at the Cottage. The first Sunday uh, I, I spoke, Tim messaged me, and, and um, he said, how'd it go? How was the service? What was, the, what was it like? And how was it? I said, we had a little conversation by text message. Second service, not a word. He is out. He has forgotten us. He's not even thinking about me or thinking about you. And I don't expect him to say anything today either. He's just going to like, he'll pick up the mess when he, come, when he comes back. Um, so Tim has, Tim has left the building. Um, we have to go to Exodus chapter 20, verse 14, and then we're going to hop mostly to John chapter 8. Not a long message today, just a couple of, of quick points about the subject of adultery as the seventh commandment. And uh, Exodus chapter 20, verse 14, simple statement, you shall not commit adultery. Pretty, pretty, or kill somebody. All right, so I may have forgotten to adjust last week's slide. I'm hope. <laughs> Yet, <laughs> well, this is going bad. We can, we, can edit, we can edit this on the video, right? I can send you the new one. We can, in the public eye, it'll look like we got our stuff together. But it's, you know, do not murder, which, of course, often is the result of adultery. That's what would happen to, that's what would happen, that's what would happen to me, um, so Exodus 20:14. this is going smashingly well. Uh, John chapter 8, verse 2, though, is where I want to land today. And I want to put the scripture out to you, read it, and then I want to uh, circle back to the, to, to the Exodus piece, and we'll work our way through. And hopefully this is the right scripture. Maybe I say either. Very, very nice. <laughs> okay, John chapter 8, verse 2, which I think I, is in the, in the, go ahead. Is it in there? Did I mess that up or two? Or am I, yeah, you were okay. It's just, I sent it earlier this way, and then I, then I got a message from Sean this morning that didn't get it, so I, anyway, it's, it's Sean's fault. Uh, Exodus, sorry, John chapter 8, verse 2. At dawn, he appeared, this is Jesus, he appeared again in the temple courts, where all the people gathered around him, and he sat down to teach them. This is something that Jesus did. Went to the temple courts, sat down, but he gathered around. He started to teach them stuff. Verse 3, the teachers of the law and the Pharisees, who always give all kinds of grief, um, brought in a woman caught in adultery. They made her stand before the group and said to Jesus, Teacher, this woman... Uh, was caught in the act of adultery. In the law of Moses, uh, the law of Moses commanded us to stone such uh, a woman, women. Now, what do you say? They were using this question as a trap in order to have a basis for accusing him. But Jesus bent down, started to write 
on the ground with his finger. It's all, all kinds of fun stuff. People talk about what Jesus could have, could have um, wrote in the sand. They didn't have Facebook, so it was probably a post about the sins of the other people. When they kept on questioning him, he straightened up and he said to them, let any, any one of you who is without sin be the first to throw the stone. Whoever is without sin, be the first to throw the stone at her. Again, he stooped down and he wrote some more stuff on the ground. Verse 9, at this, those who heard began to go away one at a time, the older ones first, until only Jesus was left with the woman standing there. Jesus straightened up and asked her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? No one, sir, she said. Neither do I condemn you, Jesus declared. Now go and leave your life of sin. So, Father, we, we obviously uh, are very aware that we are sinful people. We, we are aware that we could not cast a stone because we are not without sin. But we thank you, God, that you have made us without sin, that you have washed our sins away, and you have not condemned us, and you have set us free, and we are grateful for that this morning. Help us, God, as we look into your word to discover a few things that you'd want to say to us through your Holy Spirit and speak to us very clearly. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Okay, let's go back to, the, you can, don't have to worry about the slides, but let's go back to the, the principle of the day, which is do not commit adultery. It's the seventh of the Ten Commandments. Uh, and the Ten Commandments is a, is a, is a quite interesting um, piece of, of um, literature and, and, and revelation from, from the Lord. And the Ten Commandments is not a list for us to, to yell at society. It's not, it's not, it's not, the Ten Commandments aren't ammo for Christians to yell at people and to say, you can't do this. The Ten Commandments, under, if you understand it correctly, they were, they were commandments for Israel. They were told to Israel. They were not told and they were not given to the Amalekites, the main enemy of Israel. They weren't, they weren't these are the commandments for, for uh, the Amalekites. These were the commandments for Israel. That's very important. Now, would the Amalekites have done well to listen to the commandments? Of course. Would our society do better if we followed the Ten Commandments? Of course. But the Ten Commandments were written for Israel, and that's very, very important because Israel is a metaphor of the church. The promises that God says to Israel are the promises that God says to the church. And so when you read the scripture, it says, Hear, O Israel, and it goes on with some uh, blessing or promise or rebuke. When he says, Hear, O Israel, you could substitute out Israel for church. Hear, O church. What this, and then go from there, because it becomes a symbol and a metaphor for the church. So the Ten Commandments is, is, is directed to Israel, directed to church. It's how we then ought to live. These are the, these are the, the code of conduct for Christians. They are, they, are, um, they are for believers. Now, of course, the principles are very important, but the rules for us, the church, which makes them even more poignant to us. Sometimes we get too bent out of shape when non-believers don't act like believers. But that's kind of how it works. We can't expect non-believers to act like believers. We can only expect believers to act like believers. Now, would non-believers have better lives and would things go better for our society if everybody acted like believers, like what believers are supposed to act like? Of course. But believers, non-believers sometimes don't. When we used to do a, a, a number of things in Thailand, and I think one or two trips, Sandy came with me, and they would get it. You, you, transportation in Thailand is a complete gong show. It's a complete nightmare. You, you, you get these things called tuk-tuks, and you, they have one wheel in the front and, uh, and uh, two wheels in the back, and you sit in the back in this seat, and then some lunatic drives the thing th through, the, through the city, and sometimes they had motors, and sometimes they just had feet, and they drag you through traffic, and there's no rules. And, and interesting thing enough, you would have about 16 lanes of traffic on a, on a, on a Kingsway drive size street, and they'd be weaving back and forth and back, and it'd be just absolutely, and there was not a line to be seen. 
They don't even have the paint for the lines. It's let's just build, let's just build a street. Let's make it 48 and a half feet wide. And let's let people just go. We don't need lines. We don't need, we don't need any sort of system or structure of how this is going to work. Let's just dump everybody, horses, buggies, people pulling carts by feet, motorized vehicles, high-performance cars. Let's put them all in the same street and just run. And that's what they do. And we would get in this thing, and I've been in there a few times in Sandy. We get in this and we're like, what is happening? Everybody's going chaos. And nobody is beeping their horn at anybody. When somebody moves out of their lane, nobody gets upset. Nobody goes crazy because they expect people to get out of their lane. We expect that guy to pull over in front of you. We expect that person to pull out. Nobody's getting upset. Nobody's, it's not taking them by surprise that somebody, oh, that guy just pulled into my lane. Now, it's different here, right? We have lines and lanes. And, and Sandy has road rage. And, you know, if somebody dri- even, even thinks about drifting, into her lane, uh, her little Volkswagen, we had to upgrade the horn. We had to actually put in the air horn for her so she could lay on that. Thing. Because we have lines and lanes and we have rules and we know how it's supposed to go. And we get upset when somebody steps outside and comes into our lane. But, but in Thailand, they don't do that because everybody expects everybody to be in everybody else's lane. And, and the principle sort of applies here where, where God gives us a list of rules and we can't get outraged Every time somebody breaks a rule, because the rules are for us. They, they, are, they are for us. And we get so bent as sheep when the world doesn't live the way that Christians are supposed to live. Because they're not Christians yet. The commandments aren't commands for us to yell out, thou shalt not. The commandments are for us to yell to ourselves, I shall not. Now, are the Ten Commandments best practices for societies? Of course. Should non-Christians and Christians follow them? Of course. I shall, do not kill is a great rule for everybody, right? Do not commit adultery is a great rule for everybody. Should Canadians follow them? Of course. And should our laws take their cues from the Ten Commandments? Of course. Should our government take its cues from the Ten Commandments? Of course. But the Ten Commandments are, re- are, are, are really more personal than that. They aren't, a, they aren't a list that we can put up into our world and say, hey, everybody, you got to do this. It would be nice. But it really is, hey, Jim, you need to do this. You need to avoid this. So then it comes down to this number seven, which is adultery. And as we understand the adultery in that framework, I'm going to talk a little bit about it because I want to set this up because I have a f- the, the challenge is, if I don't talk about this, but I get to the second part of the message, which is really grace-filled, um, we, c- we can misunderstand that, that, um, that I'm being easy on sin. Because whenever preachers preach grace, uh, we sometimes get accused of watering down the truth. And so I don't want to dismiss the truth that the Bible says you are not to have, people are not to commit adultery. And so adultery is, is one of the boxes that we checked. We're not allowed to do that. You just can't do that. It's very clear. It's repeated over and over in Scripture. It's just not a thing Christians are permitted to do. And it's always a sin, regardless of, of who you are. So, of course, it's, it starts with marriage is important. That's why adultery, not community adultery, is, is important. Because marriage is important. And, and, and it's, it's, it's unfortunate that in our society, uh, for sure, uh, marriage is less important. It's, it's, it's not as big of a deal as it used to be, but Scripture says it's very important and, and it's sacred. It's, it's something that's very, very holy. Because marriage is not, a co- it's, not a, it's not a civil agreement. It's a covenant. You know, it's not two people come together and they sign a piece of paper and say, okay, we're married. It's all good. We check the boxes on our T4 slips and away we go, or whatever those forms are we use. It, it's, 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 it's not that. Now, the world would say that it's, it's that, that you just, it's a legal contract. But marriage is actually a covenant. So there aren't just two parties involved in a covenant, like biblical covenants. There are three parties involved in the covenant. There's you, your spouse, or your spouse-to-be, or whatever situation, and God. There are three people into an agreement. There are witnesses to that sacred institution, because marriage is important. And it's very, very important that we never lose our fundamental understanding of the sacredness of marriage because marriage is the main metaphor for the church and the, and the groom, 
right? We fail to understand what God has sort of laid out for, for marriage in the human world. We, we can miss what God has laid out as a, as, a, as a symbol, as a metaphor for Christ and the church. And all through Scripture, you see bridegroom language. We are the bride of Christ, right? And, uh, that is, it, that, and, and if we begin to, to lose our understanding of what marriage is like, we begin to lose the understanding of Christ's relationship with the church and Jesus' relationship with us because those things are sacred. And those metaphors are very, very important in Scripture. And so as we understand marriage well, we understand the bride and groom relationship between Christ and his church. Bride and groom language are there. We talk about the wedding feast. It's a big deal for people who like to eat. It's, it's, for if you're a foodie, when you read the scripture about the wedding feast, you get excited about that. I wonder if they're going to have seafood or crab legs or whatever it is people are into. And, and it, 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 it's, it, it also, it's just like, it's like you know, the, the, the metaphor just has so many implications. The, the bride and goes and lives with her husband. And it's the same way, it's gonna, someday the trumpet's going to blast and, 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 and the bride, us, is going to go live with the groom, with the husband. And all the same principles apply, right? Like, so, so uh, husbands have to treat their wives, or supposed to, try to, treat their wives as Christ treats the church. Right, so this, this, this is the way it's, the principles are all through Scripture. So if Sandy and I are getting chased by a bear, I have to run slower. Those are the rules, right? It doesn't, if she decides that she's going to walk it, I got to walk it. it because because the, 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 the groom lays down his life for the bride, and Christ laid down his life for the church. And the principle runs through it. And, and we can get all kinds of tangents on, on, on male-female relationships, but the, at the core of it all, the husband is to lay down his life for the bride. So if, if you're eating a bunch of things, and you and your wife have eaten a bunch of things, it doesn't matter how many of those things you have eaten, when it gets down to the last thing, the wife owns that thing. Right? The wife owns, owns that, that thing. When I, <laughs> just being silly. Those are the rules. There are all these rules, and they come from a bit of a core in, 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 the, in Scripture. Now, it, it actually is, is sort of ingrained a little bit in us. Like, so if, if we go to, if I take somebody, some, like Sandy, fa- somewhere fancy, like Wendy's, right? We go to Wendy's, and I always have to sit facing the door. I want, this, I want the line of sight to the entrance of the restaurant to be in my line of sight. So that if, <laughs> if anybody decides to come into Wendy's and, and wreak havoc, it's not going to happen behind my back. It's going to ha- happen in front of me so that I can get to that intruder before he gets to the church, before he gets to th- the bride. Or when we're walking down the street... On, on a sidewalk, I'm on the traffic side, right? So if a car swerves, the first person getting taken out is me, which is scary because it does just give her the opportunity to put a little, you know, a little nudge and I'm out in the traffic. But that's, a, that's the risk I'm willing to take. But th- there's, this, there's <laughs> this principle in, in Scripture where, where, where Christ lays down his life for his bride. Now, that's where we get to today. The bride also has some responsibility. And the church has some responsibility in how she behaves with the church. So the important med- marriage metaphor is very significant. Of course, adultery is wrong. It's kind of a universally accepted truth. Everybody, Christians, non Christians, like sort of believe that adultery is, is, is not appropriate. It's wrong. It has devastating consequences. And People can sometimes find ways for excuses for why they cheat, but fundamentally, as a society, we understand that there really is no exclusion clauses for it. You just, you, you, you can't cheat on your spouse. It doesn't matter. Life is hard. Still can't cheat. My marriage is not fun. Still can't cheat. I'm not happy. Still can't cheat. What terrible advice people give. Just do what makes you happy. Don't do what makes you happy. My goodness. What a ridiculous piece of advice. Do make, what would make me happy is to have a Dairy Queen blizzard every day three times. That would make me happy. 
So uh, adultery is a serious violation, and of course, so significant in the Ten Commandments that it was, it was required death. If somebody committed adultery, you take them out, you find rocks bigger than this, and then you throw them at them, and they die. That's, that's kind of the, the weight of the adultery thing of required desk. Required. But now I want to jump you to John chapter 8, where we want to land and close. We have this story <coughs> in the Bible of, of Jesus having an encounter while he's teaching people. Now, they find this woman. They, for some reason, they didn't bother to bring the man. Uh, they find this woman. They bring her to the church. Right? He's at the temple teaching. They said, oh, we've caught her doing this. Let's bring her to the church, and let's, as a church, hit her over the head with rocks. This is their, this is their plan. And so they bring, they say, ah, we got him now, because the Old Testament says this, and we bring her, and we got the rocks, and we got the, we're here at the church, and we got the rabbi, and we're going to do this thing. And they, they walk in, and they say, oh, we got there's no way he can find a clever answer for this one. And then, and then Jesus responds very differently to what they think. And one of the f- interesting things about the Old Testament is we sort of fundamentally believe that somewhere about 2,000 years ago, God got saved and became nice. Right? That, that he was really, really mean back in those days, but then 2,000 years ago he came along and, and he, he just became a nice person. He had a nap and everything was fine. Like, we just think he, he changed personalities in the, in the New Testament. And it's absolutely not true. He, you know, the Bible says over and over, the Lord does not change. He, he didn't change. And in fact, we think, well, Jesus, Jesus just came and, and, he's, and this is what they were trying to say. Jesus, you've gone soft on the truth of the Old Testament. And Jesus doesn't go soft because in Matthew chapter 5, verse 27, he says, hey, you have heard it said that you shall not commit adultery. 28, though, says, but I tell you, anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. So Jesus doesn't wash away the Old Testament prince. He doubles down on them and says, hey, physical adultery, bad. Heart adultery, also bad. You get really upset at adulterers. Hey, guess what? You're all adulterers. And Jesus doubles down. And, 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 and it's important that we understand that context when we, when, when we see them bringing this woman to Jesus. They wanted him to, to, to really give it to her because they could feel good about themselves. And, and at least they were not like her. And Jesus says, you're exactly like her. Well, at least I'm not like that person. You're exactly like that person. At least they don't lie. Yeah, you do. At least they don't have, you know, a bad attitude. Yeah, you do. At least I've never committed adultery. Yeah, you have. And so Jesus comes up with the famous line. He says, hey, if you got, you got, you know, if you're, if you're, if you're good, if you've got no sin, you grab a rock, throw it. We're exactly like that woman. And here's the, here's the principle that comes out of the Scripture. Condemnation is not our job. Condemning people is not our job. These dudes thought that the Ten Commandments were rocks to throw. They thought they were rocks to throw. They weren't. They were principles for them, believers, to follow. We get so concerned about other people's sins. Here's the truth. I don't have time to worry about your sins. I got enough of a job to worry about my own. Now, I might not be committing adultery, but inside my heart, <clears throat> there's, some, there's some dark stuff going on. And I can't worry about you getting your ducks in a row because I've got my own ducks to get in a row, and my ducks aren't even in the pond. I just don't have the, and Jesus says to us, you know, 
don't be so worried about uh, what everybody else is doing and, 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 and think about what you're doing. I don't have time. So they holler into church, and, and, and we, we, we love that verse, John 3, 16, for God so loved the world, he gave his only son. But 17 says, he did not come into the world to condemn the world. And he says to them, okay, guys, you're right. That's what the Old Testament says. So if you don't have, if you don't, if, you know, if you don't have any sin, go ahead, pick one up. Pick one up. Pick one up. Give it a chuck. Throw it out there. And we look down on our hands, and we notice that we're carrying some rocks. Right? We flip on Facebook. We got a pocket full of them. We walk. We walk. We see society. We see what we got a full of rocks. And, and Jesus is. And we get. Also, Jesus says, "All right. I see you've got a rock in your hand there. I see you got some commandments in your hand. Go ahead. Give it a toss. And of course, none of us can toss the rock." hard truth of the day that morning or that evening when they brought the woman to Jesus was that nobody there could throw the rock except there was one person there who could throw the rock. Because Jesus said, if anybody's here with no sin, grab it, throw it. The only person who could have been guilt-free and thrown a rock refused to throw it. The only person who was entitled to throw the rock could have, could, have, could have done it. But instead, he said, go and sin no more. He didn't pick up a rock. Go and sin, sin no more. Compassion was the default response of Jesus. Whenever there was a difficult situation, an unfortunate situation, a frustrating situation, the go-to emotion for Jesus was compassion. Remember, he, he, <laughs> he, well, there's a story in John, um, Mark 4, Mark 5, somewhere around there. Jesus, to get in a boat, to get away from the people, and, they, and they're like, they're peopled out. I get peopled out sometimes. They're peopled out, and they go across the lake, and when they get to the other side, what do they find? 5,000 people. <laughs> And, and it would have been more like 10 or 12,000 people. And, all, and, and, and they met this frustrated situation. But the Bible says, but Jesus had compassion on them. Compassion on them. Because they were like sheep without a shepherd. What would it take for our default emotion to be compassion instead of outrage? when we see non-believers behaving badly, what would it look like to have compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd? Instead of my normal response of outrage, they start typing and then they got to backspace, 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 backspace. What would happen if, if as believers we really understood that, that uh, Jesus says for us, do not condemn, but be compassionate. He was not shocked by her sin. So he was, oh, the outrage, the travesty. He was moved with compassion. Just an amazing transformation. And it, between the Old Testament and the New Testament, as Jesus unpacks the, in the Old Testament, cleanliness was a real thing. And if you were unclean, you would make everything around you unclean. The clean would become unclean because an unclean thing showed up. Jesus comes <clears throat> and he says, the unclean thing will be made clean when a clean thing comes around. And we, oh, we're going to contaminate us. <laughs> the end of the story is it turns out okay. We make the unclean, clean. We are not at the mercy of the culture. We don't have to go all crazy with outrage. What we have to do is go all crazy with compassion. We don't need to throw stones. We need to throw compassion on adulterers and every other type of sinner. And by being clean, we'll make the unclean thing clean. 
it's not an us versus them. It's not them versus the woman. It's, it's Jesus saying, hey, go and sin no more. I don't condemn you. Go and go and sin no more. I'm going to ask the worship team to come back. Thank you, worship team. The point of the adultery story, of course, is do not commit adultery. The second point, of course, and probably the greater point is Jesus had compassion. And our response needs to be, let's, needs not to be, let's grab a rock. Our response needs to be, let's grab compassion. Now, before we get too far away, let me wrap up with this. The Old Testament said that if you commit adultery, very big deal. Such a big deal that you have to die because you did it. You could misread John 8 and say, oh, Jesus has changed the rules. You don't have to die when you commit adultery. It's not the case. Jesus said, somebody has to die for this adultery. And she didn't know it then, and the Pharisees and Sadducees didn't know it then, but Jesus knew it then that he was going to take the death for the adulterer. He was going to take the death for the adulterer. The penalty was still due. The price was still be paid. The invoice was still outstanding. There was still a transaction that had to happen to make this all go away. And when he said to the woman, I don't condemn you, go and sit down. He wasn't saying, ah, don't worry about it. We'll just wipe this debt. We'll pretend it didn't exist. He said, I don't condemn you. I will go and I'll pay it. So if anybody's going to take a rock to the temple, it's me. And the death penalty was still due. And the truth of the matter is, every sin that we commit, there is still a penalty due. That thing you did yesterday, that thing you did last year, the price for that is still, still due. But Jesus said, hey, I don't condemn you. Go and sin no more. And in a few days, I'm going to pay that for you. And the greatest truth that we understand, and the way, the way that it will change the way we look at our society and our world is to understand that just because Jesus said to us, I don't condemn you, stop sinning, it doesn't mean that the price won't be paid for my sin. The price was paid for my sin. It's just me that didn't have to pay it. And Jesus did. And that changes the way we look at the people around us. When they drift in our lanes, we understand, I'm a lane drifter too. When somebody sins, our, our response isn't outrage. It's compassion. Because we understand that my sin and their sin is being paid by Jesus. So, Father, We're, we're, we're grateful that you have paid our sins. God, help us not to think we're better than, but help us to understand that we've been made clean. Not through our own doing, but through the blood of Jesus Christ. We thank you, God, that you decided to not throw the stone at us when you were fully within your rights to do it. We thank you, God, for taking the stone for us. We remain grateful in this place that no matter the volume or the magnitude or the frequency of our sin, you have said to us, there is no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. So we stand here, we sit here justified, washed and clean, because of your good grace and your willingness to pay for our price. Father, I pray if anybody is in this room and they have not turned their life over to you to have their sins washed, that, to, to allow you to pay their penalty, I pray that this morning your Holy Spirit would convict and you would draw and you would just make aware in their spirit 
of the gift that's available to walk just as if they had never done a single thing wrong as they're justified by faith. Thank you for what you're doing in our lives. And thank you for this church. I ask your blessing on them as they face a new season of ministry. We ask a blessing upon Pastor Tim. Anoint him, use him, give him direction and vision for what needs to happen in this place so that, that, that those around here would come to know you as Savior, friend, and Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. The Lord is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and rich in love. The Lord is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and rich in love. And the Lord
I thank you for your compassion to each one of us. And Lord, I pray that you would help us this week to give compassion to those around us. We thank you and we bless you in Jesus' name. Amen. Have a good week, everyone. We're so happy to share our service with you. If you'd like to keep up with everything going on at Kingsway, make sure to like our Facebook page or follow us on Instagram. If this is your first time with us, there's a link in the description to our online connection card. We'd love to get in touch with you. If you'd like to donate to us, text any amount to 84321 or click the link below. God bless you, and we hope to see you next week.